Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Christine Hammond. I'm the executive director of the, the AIA Long Beach South Bay chapter. And uh, you're here for the fourth of our series of how we house and our, our program is obviously focusing on Long Beach South Bay. Uh, next slide, please. You can access this, uh, this program will be recorded and you can access the other uh, prior recordings of how we house on YouTube, just search AIA California. Next slide. We are very confident there will be lots of questions. So please type your question into the chat box and we'll get to those uh, at the end of the program. And our speakers uh, do have some time to stay on a little bit longer after the presentation um, to, to try to get to everybody's questions. Next slide. So today, uh, the learning objectives are to share the concept of self-certification and how it was applied to a homeless shelter in the city of Bellflower, learning how, to, how modular housing can reduce the cost and expediting construction schedules, what are the opportunities and challenges, understand how the use of buildings can be a viable option, especially with limited buildable land, what are the opportunities and challenges, and learning how cities are providing housing for the missing middle via an entity known as the California Statewide Communities Development Authority. Next slide. So before we dive into our presentation, we're going to hear from Amber Lee Leslie, who's with the Housing uh, California Authority. Hi, I'm Amber Lee Leslie, a legislative advocate at Housing California. Housing California is a nonprofit advocacy organization that leverages our deep relationships with coalitions and practitioners across the state to shape the narrative on affordable housing and homelessness, build and shift power to elevate underrepresented communities, and drive transformative policy change that supports homes, health, and wealth in thriving communities. I'm really grateful to be able to welcome you to the American Institute of Architects How We House event. California has the highest poverty rate in the country when accounting for cost of living. While housing costs are significantly higher in coastal and urban areas, low and stagnating wages in rural inland areas also make it difficult for low-income households to make ends meet. There are 2 million very low and extremely low-income Californians who struggle to find housing that is affordable to them. In 2019, nearly 5 in 10 very low-income households and eight in 10 extremely low income households were severely cost burdened, meaning they spend more than half of their incomes on housing costs. We are now witnessing the economic reverberations of these statistics, which have been heightened by the COVID-19 pandemic. Some of our neighbors who enjoyed modest incomes lost their jobs when their workplaces shuttered. Some have slipped into poverty and fear the threat of eviction, while others have fallen into homelessness. California's homeless population increased by nearly 7% early last year to over 160,000. Yet paradoxically, despite record low interest rates that would typically spur residential construction, developers across the country have faced increased costs associated with labor and material shortages. Never before has the scale of our housing affordability crisis been so great. If you were like me, you recognize that the scale of our housing crisis demands that we all pitch in towards solutions. In collaboration with the California Housing Partnership, Housing California has chartered a comprehensive set of policy solutions to end homelessness, meet our state's housing needs, and advance racial equity and economic inclusion in just 10 years. Our Roadmap Home 2030 offers strategies in key five areas. First, we need to invest in our values by providing ongoing financial resources to create affordable homes. Second, we need to promote fairness in our tax systems to rectify structural discrimination and generate the revenue needed to meet the scale of California's housing need. Third, we must advocate for public policies that ensure renters have equitable access to housing and are protected from market speculation and systematic discrimination. Fourth, we support policies that create efficiencies and accountability in government. And finally, we need to reimagine growth so that developing affordable homes in all communities is easier and cheaper 
especially in areas of opportunity and places where Black, Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and other people of color traditionally have been excluded. You can learn more about all our 57 policy solutions by visiting roadmaphome2030.org. We are grateful to our statewide partners who advocated with us to secure support from the California legislature and Governor Gavin Newsom for unprecedented levels of housing investment. $2 billion will be allocated over the next two fiscal years to help local jurisdictions address homelessness. $2.75 billion over the next two years have been allocated to augment Home Key, which builds on the success of Project Room Key by providing funding to localities to serve those experiencing homelessness by acquiring and rehabilitating hotels, motels, and vacant apartments. $500 million will go towards California's Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. In coming years, we will continue to utilize our Roadmap Home 2030 to advocate that LIHTC expansion be made permanent as it is a critical and reliable source of funding for affordable housing. Additional state resources have also been allocated to improve home buyer assistance programs, to preserve naturally occurring affordable housing, and prevent eviction and foreclosure. In all, nearly $12 billion have been allocated to end and prevent homelessness and spur affordable housing development in our state. As an industry, these historic affordable housing investments buoy our spirits. Yet we know that durable change takes time. And so that means we must continue our advocacy and partnership for solutions like the ones I just mentioned. We look to you to join our efforts as creative visionaries, as masters of the long game, as jacks of all trades to help us move California towards a vision of housing that is sensitive to a community's history, its culture, its landscape, toward a vision of housing that is as affordable as it is beautiful. I hope you enjoy the program. Great. Uh, some information about the Long Beach South Bay AIA chapter area. We have about 40, 41 cities in total in, the, in our area. We are um, completely within the county of Los Angeles, um, essentially El Segundo to the Northwest, South to Long Beach and uh, Northeast to Whittier. Um, a couple of logistics for today, you will be earning one learning unit, uh, health, safety, welfare. And if um, you are an AIA member and you are looking for credits, please make sure that your participant name on your screen reflects the name that you registered under. Next slide. Okay, I would like to introduce uh, Michael Bond, AIA. He's principal at Studio 111. He's a current board member on our chapter and he's also a former past president of our chapter. Take it away, Michael. Thank you, Christine. Next, please. Um, I'll talk just briefly about the region that comprises our chapter. Um, for thousands of years, uh, the inhabitants were really the Tongva uh, people. And um, a, a few hundred years ago, the, the, the first migration of settlers that came in were the Spaniards and they had developed the California mission uh, system as well as started to subdivide the land into ranchos that were given to um, many of the prominent Spaniards that helped California's expansion. Um, from there, as those ranches grew and, th and thrived, they were purchased by many folks from the Eastern seaboard uh, known as Yankees. And um, those, these folks then started to develop the ranchos into small towns and broad industry to our region. If you, uh, the red line here is an approximation of, of our chapter boundaries, so you can get a sense of which ranchos were uh, uh, comprised of our boundaries during that time. Next, please. And so when, um, th this is an image of Long Beach prior to uh, the stock market crash in 1929. You can see it was developed on a grid system. It was a very traditional way of planning a city, uh, very similar to cities that were developed uh, in both in the Midwest and back East. Uh, you can see beyond in the image, uh, very little development in Orange County and beyond. And this was really the, the next wave of immigration of Middle East, uh, not Middle Easterners, I'm sorry, Westerners, middle Midwesterners from uh, the middle of our country 
that came here. They brought very conservative values. Uh, during this time, the Port of Long Beach was developed, the railroads were developed and oil was discovered. So it was a very uh, booming, positive period of time for development. And then if you go to the next slide, as I mentioned earlier, the stock market crashed, the beginnings of the Great Depression hit and it hit Southern California um, uh, hard as well as other parts of the country. There was a great disparity of wealth. Some people did all right during this time, others did uh, very badly. And so in 1938, the County of Los Angeles created the Housing Authority, which um, uh, granted it powers to, to build affordable housing. And the first affordable housing project or development in Southern California was actually um, Carmelitos and it is located in Long Beach and still exists today. It's comprised of about uh, 62 buildings and um, about, or 67 buildings and 670 units. And it was planned in the uh, garden city movement style, much more suburban in nature. You can see that the city grid is not, uh, um, used as a, as a planning uh, organism or, or organization to arrange these buildings. And it's really the forebearer of suburban development, which spread through the rest of the city after the war. Next. And this is an image right after World War II of Long Beach. Um, you can see the, uh, all the oil uh, pumping uh, stations in the back. Um, the, the, the next wave of significant immigration came after World War II when World War II veterans came back to Southern California to port and decided not to go back to their home states, but actually decided to stay in Southern California. And this period of growth really filled the boundaries of our city. Uh, most of the land was developed uh, either into industry or housing and um, manufacturing became a, an important part of our jobs component, the aerospace industry, which started uh, during World War II continued to grow, defense industry grew, and another migration of folks came here that were primarily uh, black and brought us a, a significant black population to our city during this time, uh, pursuing those jobs in the manufacturing industry. Next, please. And then over the next several decades, uh, there really wasn't an opportunity to grow much. Uh, I, as I mentioned, development was built to the boundaries and um, yet we were still having waves of migration here. Uh, uh, a large Latino population now is in Long Beach as well as a Cambodian population. And uh, in fact, at, at the year 2000, Long Beach was considered the most diverse city within our country and, and still is an extremely diverse city today. And by this time, by the beginning of the 20th century, the city was looking at encouraging uh, development not outward as we did in the past, but upward and providing uh, um, a, a new downtown plan for, for downtown that has encouraged a significant amount of development over the last 20 years and has allowed us to grow. And I think we'll hear more from the city about uh, other, other ways of, of promoting housing uh, shortly. Next, please. And then finally, I, um, as, as we look towards the future, this is an image for the 2028 Olympics. Uh, the, I, I'd say the city is really embracing its waterfront again from a sport, leisure and entertainment perspective. And um, Long Beach is also looking at its downtown and its city overall to, to evolve into a, a really wonderful, great waterfront metropolis. Um, um, you know, as the only waterfront city between San Francisco and San Diego, I think it has a wonderful opportunity to continue growing in a very positive direction. Next, please. And with that, I'd like to pass over uh, the next presentation to Allison with the city of Long Beach. Thanks, Michael. Next slide, please. So as we talk about what the housing crisis really is, this is some helpful framing uh, from the Sacramento Bee that talks about it as three interrelated policy prog problems that you probably recognize. So one of people experiencing homelessness and at risk of homelessness, high rent burden and cost for our lower income residents, as well as high housing costs and barriers to home ownership among all residents, even moderate and upper income residents, which is resulting in high rent, stagnant home ownership, shrinking K through 12 enrollment and other abnormal demographic changes that we're seeing here in Long Beach. Next slide, please. 
So you may be familiar with some of these stats. 43% of um, residents in Long Beach are housing cost burden, meaning they pay too much for their rent or mortgage. You can see the cost of average rent and mortgage on the slide. 60% of our residents are renters. Rents increased 20% citywide, yet wages have stag stagnated over the last decade, as we heard in the video earlier. That's happening here in Long Beach as well. Next slide. And you can see that our housing production has not kept up with population for a long time. So the graph on the left shows population increase in green and housing production in blue. In particular, since the 1980s, you can see how housing production has gone way down, even as our populations increased. And that our housing stock is very old, as you can see on the right. Of course, we have some historic structures, but over 70% of our structures in the city are more than 50 years old, which leads to more need for improvements and issues with that stock. Next slide, please. Uh, another issue of not having enough housing is overcrowding. About 20,000 households in Long Beach experience overcrowding, mean, meaning families are doubling or tripling up. We saw that as a big issue during COVID when density was not a predicting factor of community spread, but overcrowding was. If you have nowhere that you can stay isolated when there's a case and there are other challenges with overcrowding. Next slide. So we've already heard a little bit about the different constraints to getting housing built. There are some things in the city's control, like regulation of land use, um, development standards, zoning, et cetera. We have limited financial intervention these days, as well as some amount of city old property. But there's also a lot that's not in our control related to actual construction, um, economic and market conditions, federal and state laws, wage and labor standards, and many more. Next slide. And so as we're working on updating our housing element or our long range plan for how to address housing need in the city, the state and uh, region have allocated us the need for 26,000 new housing units over the next eight years. And to put that in context, we've built about 3,500 in the last eight years. Next slide. Over half of those units need to be some level of affordable or moderate income um, to meet the needs of our community. And a big part of that 26,000 unit need comes from our existing population. Again, we have about 20,000 uh, residents in overcrowded conditions, households actually. Next slide. And as we look at where, where can we develop new housing to meet that um, Rena, you can see the areas in dark blue are where our land use regulations allow more dense housing in the city along our commercial corridors and near transit. And then the ones in yellow show where we have identified sites for our housing element site inventory. But you can see we have almost 47% are either commercial or industrial land uses, as well as a light blue, another 44% are low density residential zone today. So not an opportunity for significant new housing. Next slide. So now I'm gonna now I'm gonna shift into sharing a few strategies we've been working on to help start to address this need. You may be familiar with accessory dwelling units, where, which are a low cost uh, housing solution and can be applied citywide. You can see on the right the map of where we've had ADU applications in the last few years. You can see that's much more spread out than the map I showed a moment ago. And and since 2018, the state's made it really easy to build ADUs. They're by right. You have to meet only very limited development standards, no new parking requirements. It's a, a 60 day approval process. And our production of ADUs has more than quadrupled since 2018. And our housing element has new programs and policies to further support that production through more pre-approved plans, funding, and um, supports for people to construct those units. Next slide. Another strategy we've been working on is developing new zoning regulations to implement our newly adopted general plan land use element by expanding allowances for mixed use and residential development, um, having a broader range of housing typologies and mixed uses, development standards to make it more walkable and visually appealing. Our new Title 22, which is a new title of the code, also simplifies with broader use categories, provides more flexibility and no longer requires a, additional parking for changes of use, and has development incentives for desired uses such as grocery stores. One example on the right, you can see how we are um, addressing minimal setbacks while still in, ensuring a public realm from a walkability perspective by getting rid of your traditional setback approach and taking the sidewalk into consideration when we do setbacks. Next slide. And finally, even with our newly adopted land use element in doing more recent research, we've realized that for many of our lots that are shallow or small, even with new regulations, housing does not pencil out as you can see on the right. And so we've developed an enhanced density bonus program that goes above and beyond state law 
to allow more density, height, and other development and concessions in exchange for affordable housing units. It allows up to a 70% bonus anywhere in the city and up to 100% bonus in, in transit rich areas, up to three stories and additional height above the typical allowances, as well as reduced parking. And it's tailored to our local conditions here in the city and how to help address our housing need. It's an important strategy for incentivizing mixed income housing development while making development more viable for many of our sites that again are constrained. And then complements the inclusionary housing requirement for our downtown and midtown while again creating this mixed income strategy citywide. We see it as an important uh, strategy for desegregating our housing in the city and providing a mix of affordable and market rate units in more locations as well as making more sites in the city uh, developable. With that, I'm going to pass it off to our deputy director, Christopher Kuntz, who's going to go through the next few slides. Thanks, Allison. So if we take the next uh, few slides, uh, my role in this presentation uh, is to summarize all the things we're also working on that we don't have time to go into um, in detail. So uh, I oversee the department's um, operations. So in addition to all the planning um, that Allison thought uh, walked you through. It's also about using our resources um, wisely. So we do receive um, federal funds from HUD that we use towards uh, developing affordable housing with our partners. And it's about sort of reevaluating those and making sure that we achieve the maximum amount of leverage on each one of those um, funding sources. Um, there is a lot of talk uh, in Washington about housing vouchers, and we're trying to more effectively use vouchers to leverage um, into future development and pursue um, additional funding um, where it's available. And then really looking at uh, modular construction and working with our private partners to see um, whether Long Beach can become a testing ground for modular. I think what we've seen is not a huge cost savings on the construction cost, but a huge time savings potentially. And to the degree that there's carrying costs on a development, it is actually a major um, potential to speed up and lower the cost of housing production. Next slide. So Allison walked you through um, much of our, our planning approach, but just to let you know, you know, we're also thinking about other pieces, trying to streamline the CEQA process or front mode the CEQA process so that individual projects aren't doing CEQA reviews. Allison talked to you about um, density bonus and about zoning, but we're also just trying to make a more effective, predictable, and transparent entitlement process. So it makes sense to staff, it makes sense to the applicant, it makes sense to the um, public at large, and, and it's all um, out in the open and, and helps us address you know, some of those concerns from folks that are, are less excited about housing growth. And we're trying to look at unit size and explore things like small unit development, but also recognizing that what we have a true shortage of in Long Beach is actually large units um, for families. Um, and Allison walked you through uh, ADU. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, so uh, that's the city you heard from us. What would really help the city succeed and help all of us produce more housing? Um, certainty and stability um, of state and federal housing investments. Um, there is a lot of new money right now from both the state and the feds for affordable housing production. That is fantastic. The fact that they're completely different rules and slightly different programs than what existed last year, just the... Um, Recovery Act versus the CARES Act, the way of utilizing the money is completely different. Um, it creates an accounting uh, nightmare and, and kind of, um, you know, it takes five to six years to develop an affordable housing project. So it's not helpful when you go through three different sets of rules during uh, the time that you're developing that project. So if there was some amount of stability, uh, that would be great. Um, flexibility, um, and then just greater buy-in. We're very proud of what we're doing here in Long Beach, but you know we have neighbors and we have a broader region and everyone's kind of running in a different direction and, and greater kind of regional buy-in and coordination would be great. Um, and I think part of that means, you know, state and local reforms fiscal. So Long Beach is a pro-housing city because we're a pro-housing city and that's what our council wants to pursue. Um, but in California, the way the tax system works, that's still a losing proposition. If a city wants to increase its uh, fiscal 
house in order, um, what they need to do is build a lot of car dealerships and uh, gas stations. So, you know, the, the way that local government is financed doesn't necessarily support um, further um, housing construction. Um, and we need all of your help um, to educate the public and opinion leaders about housing production and finance and how it actually works. Um, and I think if nothing else, if we can just teach all of our friends and neighbors and family that you can't make something more affordable without building more of it. Um, I think those sort of uh, simple lessons and, and understanding um, the 30 years of underbuilding that we have to um, overcome to address our current needs uh, would be uh, really great. So I think that is our story from here at the city. And um, we have a little bit more to share in this presentation and then looking forward to questions. And I think I'm handing it off to Sean. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, I'm Sean Rawson, the co-founder at Waterford Property Company. We're multifamily market rate developers and affordable housing developers. And I'm here to talk about um, our participation in a new innovative financing program in partnership with CSCDA to provide uh, middle income housing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, as previously mentioned, um, you know, our team is a Waterford Property Company in conjunction with uh, CSCDA, which is the acronym for um, California Statewide Community Development Authority, a joint powers authority um, that's been in existence since 1988 and is the largest JPA in the state of California. And then we've been working with Goldman Sachs as our bond underwriter to acquire market rate multifamily buildings and deed restrict them to to moderate income housing, which we really refer to as essential housing, which I'll touch on later in the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, as previously mentioned, as both Allison and, and Christopher um, and, uh, and, and previous speakers on this panel discussed, California is going through a housing crisis, um, which has led to um, you know, different societal effects, which include increased traffic congestion, pollution, crime, homelessness, health issues, poor student performance, and social um, unrest. Um, and then that's at various income levels throughout um, um, the different tiers of housing. Um, this program is really designed to provide housing to the missing middle. Um, and what that means is families that make too much to qualify for traditional, for traditional affordable housing, but still pay an inordinate amount of their monthly income for uh, market rate housing. And what's so innovative about the program um, that we're involved in with CSCDA is that there's really been no financing sources to be able to provide um, housing at this income level. You know, we do have federal tax credits and state tax credits and different, um, what we refer to in the, the affordable housing industry, um, soft sources of funding um, to provide um, low and very low and even extremely low income housing, you know, albeit not enough, um, but there's really never been a financing um, source to provide modern income housing. And that's what this program does. Uh, next slide, please. So the target demographic um, um, for, for this program is, um, you know, really it's teachers, um, public safety employees, um, uh, government uh, uh, civil servants, um, military veterans, healthcare workers, and you know, really the fabric of the, the essential workforce. Um, folks that are you know, key members of our community um, that are, are essentially spending a large, a large amount of their monthly income on housing. And really what this program is designed to do is provide those folks um, with increased monthly savings to use for other parts uh, of, their, of their life. Um, next slide, please. Um, on this slide, the, the way that that uh, that this program works is is that Waterford, in conjunction with CSCDA, um, will acquire existing uh, market rate multifamily communities um, and work with the city um, to get approval to issue bonds um, and deed restrict the units. Um, on this slide, there's some here's some recent examples of projects that uh, that we've acquired, and I'll go through the entire list on the last slide. But uh, recently. We've acquired uh, the, um, the Jefferson in Anaheim, um, Ocean Air here in the city of Long Beach, um, and then Altana 
um, in the city of Glendale. To date, um, Waterford has acquired um, uh, 10 pro or we're closing on our 10th transaction tomorrow, totaling just over 4,000 units um, in the program, um, which we're really excited and we're starting to see um, meaningful rental savings, which I'll touch on in a later slide. Next slide, please. So as, as I mentioned in, on the previous slide, the way this program works is, is that Waterford will work with the city to identify a potential uh, target acquisition um, and then issue municipal bonds to fund the acquisition of, of the project and then record a deed restriction on the property that uh, um, limits uh, the, rent, um, the rent affordability to between 60% of the AMI and 120% of the of the AMI and that runs the the term of the bonds which typically will finance uh, these transactions with 30 30 year bonds and then once the bonds are paid off um, the city is the the beneficiary to to all the long term equity at the asset which I'll I'll touch on later in the presentation as well on the next slide please so as previously mentioned um, the the that the public benefits to the city are um, cities are able to now provide moderate income housing, which has been, and as Chris and Allison uh, will, will, can, can go into greater detail on in the question section, has been extremely difficult for cities to, to provide moderate income housing. And so throughout the state of California, we're seeing record uh, rent growth. Um, over the last uh, eight years, um, rents have increased um, over 40% in the state of California. Um, and in this year, um, we're actually seeing um, um, over 12% projected rent growth um, in key um, suburban markets uh, throughout the state. Um, in addition to, to the housing benefits, which is the rental savings, um, the city, um, as previously mentioned, um, gets all of the long-term financial benefits uh, from the project meaning once the bonds are paid off, uh, the city can choose to um, step into the ownership role um, or they can decide to, to sell the asset and be the recipient of, of all the long-term equity. Um, in addition to that, you know, from a community standpoint, you know, really what this program is designed to do is to um, keep our essential workforce in the communities that they, they currently serve and work and make sure that uh, um, essential workers aren't forced to um, commute long distances, um, which leads to, to other um, public policy issues as previously discussed. Next slide. Um, from a, from a um, control standpoint, the way that these transactions work is, is that CSCDA um, takes title to the asset um, as a JPA, um, they um, are a government entity which qualifies the property for a property tax exemption. In return for the property tax exemption, there's a regulatory agreement that gets recorded on the property, which limits rents to between 60% and 120% of the area median income, which is moderate income households. And then it, uh, it caps rent growth at the lesser of AMI growth or 4%. And, what this does is it, it's extremely meaningful is that it allows households and, and residents that move into these projects to now plan and have rent certainty and what, uh, um, what their rent growth will be. So if you're living on a fixed income um, and you have a plan to um, save, for instance, for a down payment on a house, you're now able to, with certainty, plan what your future will be in terms of your household expenses um, and really gives you certainty for long-term planning. In addition to that, um, Waterford and CSCDA work with um, the, the host city um, and provide annual financial reporting um, as well as um, property condition reports. Um, and, um, and then as previously mentioned, through what we call a public benefit agreement, the city becomes the, the recipient to, to all the long-term equity in the asset. Next slide, please. So this is a... Um, a slide that shows um, a, an overview of some of the, um, the new tenants that we've gotten at, at Ocean Air. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Ocean Air, 
Ocean Air is a beautiful Class A uh, new project at, in Long Beach, a 216 unit project that we, we acquired earlier this year. Um, to date, we have leased um, 72 units um, into the essential housing program. And what this slide does is it really gives you a sense of the, uh, the demographic uh, that we're running uh, these units to, which really um, hits home in terms of those essential workers. And we're proud to say that to date, um, in the less than 12 months that we've owned this asset, um, the rents have already gone down um, 17% um, on a weighted average basis um, relative to where market rents are um, in Long Beach. And so we're seeing meaningful effects um, um, already in the short time that we've owned this asset, which is, it's been really exciting and great for us to see. Next slide, please. Um, this just touches on, uh, as previously mentioned, we've seen record rent growth this year coming um, out of the pandemic. Um, and so you know, one of the goals of this program is to be, to be able to you know, help cities plan um, and provide housing options for their residents um, so that um, households aren't priced out of the communities um, that, that they currently live, work, and, and serve. And, and we're seeing that real time with the residents um, that, uh, that are moving into our projects. Next slide, please. Um, so with that, this is really the last slide. Um, the way that this program works um, is that, that if cities um, are interested in moving forward um, with a middle income project. Um, the city council via resolution um, has to adopt a resolution to, to opt in to the joint powers authority and then um, Waterford and CSCDA will work with the city to um, finalize a, a public benefits agreement, which is the agreement that memorializes the, the, the deal points um, to the, with the city, the project administrator, um, and CSCDA, so that their city receives all of the, the long-term equity um, in the project. Um, I believe that's my last slide, so I'm gonna hand it back off to, to Studio 111, and um, I'm happy to stick around for questions later. Uh, hi, my name is Erica Stubstad. I'm the design director with Studio 111. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So as you've heard with some of the challenges facing our region, I'm gonna continue this discussion of innovative projects facing these issues, specifically homelessness. This is the new Hope Shelter in Bellflower. For decades, the number one concern for residents of Bellflower was crime, but in 2019, homelessness became the central issue. Next slide, please. In collaboration between the city, architect, contractor, and operator, New Hope Shelter was created. The team transformed an unoccupied existing 18,000 square foot warehouse into a 50 bed homeless shelter. This is the first of such homeless shelters in the Los Angeles County. Can you next slide, please. Through strong collaboration and the Bellflower self-certification process, the team was able to design, build, and fully occupy the shelter within five months, which is record speed. This process can typically take up to twice as long and even years. Self-certification is a process in which the architecture, architect and contractor assure the building and design meet building code, and it simplifies the permitting process. The shelter was operated on a referral basis with a strict no walk-up policy. Next slide, please. Here's the plan of the shelter. Um, as you can see, the blue on the bottom corner is the public base with the lobby, case managers, and administrative offices. The orange shows three main rooms for couples, women, and men um, with direct restrooms to themselves, and then a community gathering space that bleeds out into outdoor patio spaces. Next slide, please. So this is the new home shelter. When you enter the lobby, there's a beautiful mural to greet you and someone to help you. Next, we have Justin with our office. Thanks, Erica. Alrighty. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Roth with Studio 111. I'm um, going to be talking about Watts Works. Uh, it is a 25 unit um, permanent supportive housing project. Um, and this is an image um, of the project in construction, um, it is modular um, and utilizing shipping containers. And um, this was a stage in which you can see the crane next to the site and kind of all of the uh, units. We were missing one floor on top at this point in time. 
um, but it is four stories. Next slide. Um, project site is within a mile of the Watts Towers Arts Center, um, you know, north of the 105 and east of the 110. Next slide. Um, here is um, a building framework diagram showing a uh, pretty simple massing of, of the building, um, utilizing 58 shipping containers um, to uh, make up 25 units total, 24 studio units. And that studio unit you're seeing kind of broken out of the massing here is comprised of two eight by 20 um, shipping containers. Um, next slide. Uh, the project site here at Compton in 95th, you're saying it's a, it's a tiny site um, with a big goal. Um, the, the goal here is to, you know, use modular construction really to um, improve construction speed and also uh, decrease the cost of construction. Um, next slide. Here you're seeing, you know, even, even though we're using modular construction, the project still really benefits from um, a scattered open space um, use on the project with a lot of areas um, kind of set around the project to provide um, um, places where people can meet and congregate and have kind of intimate outdoor um, communal areas. Next slide. A rendering of the interior unit. Our goal really from the onset was um, in collaboration with the client was to, you know, use shipping containers, but make sure that the end product doesn't feel as if you're living within shipping containers. Um, so you're seeing a lot of um, light tones and, and finishes used in the, in, in the space to not um, make the space feel small, really kind of open it up and make it feel as large as possible. Next slide. Um, so some, some items to kind of take away. Um, this is a couple images of the construction process, but again, the goals and the benefits of modular construction is to reduce construction costs and to shift a lot of the labor that would occur on site, the expensive labor on site into a factory setting, um, and decrease the overall construction schedule and, um, and ideally move quicker through um, the approvals process. I think there's a couple caveats to keep in mind, you know, decreasing the overall construction schedule is definitely dependent on everyone having their expectations aligned and the strong team communication is present. And then um, I will say that you'll hear a lot of the approvals um, moving quicker, I think is true of some of the, the third party um, associated plan check processes. There is still a component of local review that um, takes place that sometimes length, lengthens the approval process. Um, next slide. Here's an image of, of what the, the finished product will look like. We're, we're a couple months away from wrapping the entire building and having the project complete. We're excited about it. Um, next slide, I think with the success of this project at Watts Works uh, in collaboration with the client, we're actually working on three additional modular projects. Um, the, the three projects towards the north here will utilize um, metal framing rather than steel shipping containers um, for the modular construction. Um, and uh, in total, we're providing 167 um, affordable units um, for individuals experiencing homelessness. Um, with that, I think I will transfer it over to Michael. Thank you, Justin. Uh, the last development we wanted to share with all of you is called the Armory Arts Collective. And it is an old, uh, National Guard Armory that uh, will be converted into affordable housing in the lower part of the building and then in the taller part in the, what's known as the drill hall will become an arts conservancy for St. Anthony's High School. And then in the back where there's currently a storage yard, we are looking at providing wood modular housing um, that will address or be focused on artists preference as well as uh, faculty preferences. Uh, next, please. And so this was the armory at when it was first completed in 1930. It was decommissioned in 2018 and has been unoccupied since. So um, we're excited to be part of uh, restoring this building and adaptively reusing it to bring it new life. Next, please. Uh, this is a site plan. 
in the area in blue shows the Conservancy, Arts Conservancy section for St. Anthony's High School. The yellow uh, illustrates six affordable units uh, that will be available. In the basement will be supportive services as well as arts related services for uh, the residents. The green portion just above that is going to be an arts garden. The portion below the yellow area is uh, reserved parking for the modular uh, housing component, which is located up above. Um, you can see Gumbiner Park to the right. We are pursuing IIG funding to make improvements to the park, to restoring the existing armory, as well as making other utility and infrastructure improvements around the site. Next. And this is a view uh, of the facility, the, the restored armory facility in the foreground with the arts garden right along 7th Street. And then behind it is the uh, 58 units of faculty and artist preference housing, again, made out of modular wood construction. And then uh, to the left are some of the improvements that are are being proposed for the park if IIG funding comes through. So we're, we're, we're very excited about this. And some of the lessons that we've learned in our adaptive use, reuse developments is that um, you need to do selective demolition before you start drawing. You really need to know what's behind the walls of these buildings because any of the assumptions you make will be wrong. We can tell you that from experience. So selective demolition is important. Once you have a design in place that uh, won't change, we would suggest Demo, full demolition of the areas that will not be used so that uh, before you get into construction documents so that again any surprises are are discovered before the contractor team is out there uh, restoring the building and then third having a larger contingency is always helpful as well because there just are a, a lot of unknowns that that creep up in these projects but the outcomes are actually quite wonderful because it, it, it keeps a history, a layer of history in place and brings new life to some of these really beautiful old buildings. If you go to the next slide, um, this is uh, what we're proposing for one of the alleys, which right now is not a very attractive place, but with IIG funding, we're hoping to underground the power lines and convert the alley, which has uh, no vehicular access um, other than to the armory, uh, which will relocate in, in, in the new scheme and make this into a pedestrian paseo that links to Gumbiner Park. And with that, if you go to the next slide, that this concludes our presentation. We hope you've all enjoyed it and we are open to questions. Thank you. Um, Michael, I do see a question in the chat. Why are future projects moving from shipping containers to metal studs? Not sure who wants to answer that one. Justin? Yeah, happy to take it. Um, I think the, the main uh, point is the shipping containers are, are fixed dimension, eight by 20, um, not a lot of flexibility in the modular aspect of that. And uh, the main reason that the, the, the future projects are switching to a metal framed solution is to gain that flexibility in width and in depth um, to, to allow for these units to be um, even more uh, beneficial for um, the individuals that would be living within it. I did see that there was a question that was answered posted in the Q&A option at the bottom of the screen. Um, I don't know if Christopher, you, you answered uh, Bill Zellner's question, if you wanna maybe cover that a little bit more. Uh, sure, so there was a question about sort of like, who is homeless and how did they end up homeless? Um, I mean, I'm going to answer that, but I think we sort of, even if someone becomes homeless entirely through their own mistakes, we have a sort of moral obligation and a financial interest in people not being homeless. It's very expensive to service the homeless, and it's a, it's a moral failure on all of us. So um, I posted in the chat, there's a report, you know, there are many homeless individuals that are there as the result of uh, mental health crisis, substance abuse, um, re-entry after being um, 
institutionalized or incarcerated. Um, so sort of some of the things that you would expect. But there's also a lot of folks that are um, homeless purely out of economic circumstances. And there's also people that are unhoused or homeless um, that you don't see them on the street, right? So they may be sleeping in their car. They may, you know, stay with friends or just sort of bounce around, but they don't have a, a home. Um, so I think that's important to understand. The other thing is, uh, you know, when we see rising homeless um, population numbers, you know, it can look like, oh, our homeless services are not working. And uh, homeless services is very difficult, but actually many of those programs are super effective and we are able to rehouse people and, and get people into services. Um, the problem is the number of new homeless individuals that, that are being created each and every day. So it's a complex issue. Um, I posted a kind of report there. Um, and then I think the next question is for Sean, if we wanna hand it over to Sean. There's a, a question in the chat just about, you know, sort of the time and documentation um, required to do any kind of um, deal. And can you can you talk about the merits of, you know, sort of bond financing um, compared to those kind of extra hurdles with, with time and documentation, I guess? Yeah, uh, thanks. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, thanks. Thank you for that question. Um, you know, from a, a documentation standpoint, um, the, the process can move um, fairly quickly with cities. Um, you know, we've closed uh, 10 transactions this year uh, with cities. Um, there's, you know, really the key documentation points um, are the public benefit agreement um, and then really um, working through the affordability constraints. Um, the what I would say the elegant um, component to this structure is, is that um, unlike traditional affordable housing projects where cities may have what we refer to as a residual receipts loan and there's loan documentation, um, these transactions uh, with CSCDA are really meant to shield the city from all liability. Um, they, so they aren't a party to most of the agreements. Um, and so what that does is that it shields the, the city from liability. Um, and it's just really a function of, of getting the policy goals in place with the city and working through the public benefits agreement um, and the resolution. Um, and it can really move quickly. You know, one, one more point, and, and Christopher touched on it, is you know, with all the planning constraints and development constraints, you know, typical affordable housing projects can take anywhere from three to four years from start to finish to deliver units um, in our state. And you know, what's so powerful about this program is we're able to turn um, existing units into affordable housing units in a relatively short basis. Um, but from start to finish, our typical transaction takes anywhere from 90 to 120 days, um, as previously mentioned with Ocean Air. Um, we bought that in March of this year and we've already converted 72 units, um, which is um, more than a third of the units um, in, in less than a year. So it can move quickly, um, but it's just making sure that you're on the same page uh, with the host city. Um, there's another question in the Q&A. How is parking addressed in these developments? Um, is that, uh, that wants to answer that. Is that for me, Christine? Uh, it's not directed to anyone. If anybody, any of the speakers want to want to touch on it, Justin, do you want to first hit yours? And then yeah, yeah, happy to. Um, so a, a lot of the the projects that we were that I was describing actually have a uh, uh, little to no required parking on the development. There's a uh, uh, incentives in. Uh, the city of LA and statewide that um, allow for projects with um, affordable units and specifically um, units for homeless um, to not have any required parking on site. Um, so there's, I think there's any, any range of different incentives that can be used. A permanent supportive housing um, is one of them. There is in the city of LA, um, the TOC program um, that if you are close to key transit areas, you don't have to provide parking on site. 
um, based on the level of affordability is provided uh, that's provided. Um, and and that's it. So on, on our project, you'll see there one or two or sometimes no parking provided on site for these developments that are required. And I think for, for city of Long Beach, the you know sort of generalized approach is to reduce parking requirements and provide greater flexibility, but not necessarily with the expectation that the developers will stop putting in parking, you know, sort of, um, they know what par parking is required um, for the users or residents of their building. Um, we have survey data that shows, in fact, uh, many affordable housing residents do have cars or at least aspire uh, to have cars. Um, so I don't think the answer to sort of our housing woes is to uh, not put parking and anything ever again. But I do think providing um, greater flexibility and, and, and having less onerous requirements is part of a, you know, sort of multifaceted solution. I'll add with the Armory Arts Collective that we were required very few parking stalls because of it being affordable, but we also understood that the neighborhood was parking impacted um, and that we had a high school next door. So um, working very closely with the city, we all agreed that providing more, significantly more parking uh, for that development would be beneficial for the entire community. There's a question about um, if the containers are sprinkled, sprinklered. Yeah, they are. There's a there's a requirement now I believe, for all new residential construction um, to to include fire sprinklers. So yes, the the shipping containers do come. They actually um, half of the install is done within the factory itself, and the remainder of the work will be done on site. So there's kind of two elements there um, and something to take note of, I think specifically for modular construction and maybe a little bit in the weeds, but the, the GC has uh, been adamant about using um, a sub that has a presence in both the area where the factory is and where, um, where the site for the development is occurring as well. Okay, there's also a question about materials shortages and if uh, that's impacting any lead time construction strategies moving forward, who wants to respond to that one? Um, well, I, I can speak from the modular perspective and Justin, you probably could add in as well. Yeah. Some of the products that we spec'd were just not available for, for in time. So we had to, well, uh, the, the modular company suggested alternatives that we had to review to make sure they were compliant. Um, but we had several of those instances that just we just could not get the product that we wanted in time. Yeah, Michael, I think that covers it pretty well. Yeah, I think it's just it's, we're, we're seeing a need for probably greater flexibility during the construction process, especially impacted by COVID availability of product um, uh, that we are having to look at probably um, substitutions more often now um, than before. Okay, there's a question. Housing for a, a majority of housing homeless to be successful will require ongoing mental health and substance abuse services. How is the city planning on including this type of service in the housing element and covering continued annual financial support? Sure, so the housing element addresses many aspects of our, our housing uh, crisis and does look both at how do we make it easier to build new housing, including affordable housing and uh, permanent supportive housing with services, but it also um, addresses our continuum of care and the um, health, mental health and substance abuse um, programs offered through our health department, through homeless services and through community partners. Mental health in particular is a huge issue in the city and a lack of capacity that uh, the city's been working closely with LA County to try to bring in more resources. You're abso absolutely right, it's a necessity for um, a full um, approach to this issue and it's sometimes included on site and sometimes with our community partners, but definitely in the plan. And, and how we pay for it, just so everyone's paying attention to what's happening in Washington. So when you put a um, restricted income, low income housing project together, you've got like a con conventional construction loan and then you have a bunch of other funding sources. Your biggest funding source is a tax credit, low income housing tax credit. You probably have some money from the state, um, from the county, um, from the home loan bank, maybe from philanthropy and from your, your local city and, and that's 
kind of a residual receipts loan. Um, so even if all of those services, all of those funding sources were to lower your construction cost uh, to zero through subsidy, you then have to maintain that building and you have to provide uh, services. Um, so for, for folks that are low but not very low income, that's done by them paying rent through uh, you know, a, a 30% of their income um, and that might cover operating expenses. But when you're talking about providing um, services to home, you know, formerly homeless individuals or people with very high level of services, your operating cost is higher, and then you have no money coming in at all in, in terms of operating income. So basically, the only way to do that is through enormous amounts of financial uh, support from county programs, or through what's called a project based voucher. Um, HUD, um, we're all familiar with Section 8 vouchers, which is where you have a voucher and you can go rent anywhere, but there's a different type of voucher called a project-based voucher, which guarantees a, a certain amount of income um, to the property operator so that they can maintain the property and they can provide services. Um, Project-based vouchers are dramatically under provided um, by HUD, and I think that's that's been um, part of the discussion and in, in, in the big bill that's pending in Washington and, and whether it's going to be solved in that bill or not, I guess, uh, remains to be seen, but that's how it works on on the financial end. And it's a major challenge um, for cities that's and, and for operators is often not, you know, sort of talked about, which is we can build all the affordable housing in the world, but how are you going to operate it? How are you going to pay for those, those ongoing costs? And it's an open question. Um, Christopher, and maybe also Allison, maybe you can touch on um, the question there from Jesse about why aren't cities hiring more staff if um, all the projects mentioned have streamlined city review and approvals? Uh, maybe you guys can touch on that one. Um, I, I deal with our HR problem, so I'll talk on that. I mean, uh, when you hire people, you have to pay them. So cities don't have the ability to just, you know, um, upsize their, their staff enormously. Um, but then, you know, similar to other sectors of the economy, I'm able to hire planners and engineers and, and kind of high level professionals, um, but I'm having enormous difficulties um, recruiting and retaining our entry level employees. So those are people that are really important to the development review process. They might be your technician at the counter that takes in your application. They might be the cashier that processes your payment. Um, they might be um, doing something in the back office to arrange for your inspection, especially if you know the software can't um, automatically arrange your inspection and you need some kind of special service. Um, they might be the clerk that's helping us run a planning commission meeting. Um, I have close to a 50% vacancy in some of those positions and we're offering hiring bonuses, we're recruiting, I'm doing silly Facebook videos to tell people to come work here. Um, but it's a challenge and, and I think it'll work itself out over time, but it's, it's the same challenge that, you know, truck driving, restaurants, you know, there's, there's certain labor shortages in the marketplace right now and, and cities are not immune to that. Okay, and I guess this question would be for Sean. Um, it says, I can see what you are doing helps to make affordable house housing available, but at the same time, it decreases the number of market rate housing units available. As there is not enough housing being built for middle income people as well, isn't what you are doing exacerbating the overall problem of insufficient housing construction? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And let me, let me be clear and say that we need housing of all types and, and all income levels. Um, and that touches on you know, the crisis that our, our state currently finds itself in. But one of the things is, is that what we're seeing is, is that due to financing constraints, um, we're seeing a much smaller percentage of housing being built for, for modern income households. And so over time, and we've seen this time and time again, um, in the projects in the cities that, that we're acquiring buildings in is that you're seeing those households move out of those communities. Um, so even though we need more market rate housing in, in all of California, 
um, what we're seeing is, is that there's a much smaller percentage that's being built to, to that missing middle. Um, and so it's essentially forcing those families and those households to move out of the communities um, that they're currently living in. So that all said is, is that we're seeing a crisis at all income levels um, and we need more housing at all of those various levels. But what this is doing is allowing those households to stay in the communities and retain those households. Okay, thank you. I'm not sure if this question was already answered from Jeremy. Are you aware of any funding programs for existing multifamily property owners, four to 20 units, to perform energy upgrades, lead, paint, asbestos abatement, seismic upgrades for some of these older buildings throughout Long Beach South Bay area? So, so feel free to connect with me offline if the, the building is in Long Beach, you know, we may have options for you, but they may not be good options. So uh, the city has spent a lot of money on lead abatement over time, um, and we still have programs to do that. In terms of other kinds of upgrades, um, we offer low interest loans, but um, the interest rates the uh, financial sector is offering you are pretty low right now also so they may actually be a better deal than than coming to the city so when interest rates were higher um and and, and i could offer someone a three percent um loan to do improvements on a multifamily building it was probably worth all of the administrative uh heartache of um getting a loan that you don't just have to go through the city process it's it's sort of a HUD approved loan and it's a lot of paperwork not gonna lie um you know but there was a big cost savings um it, if you can get a conventional loan at four and a half percent that might be better than dealing with me at three percent but you um you have to make a decision for yourself and and we do have um limited programs available so i'm glad to connect with you and outside of long beach um depends on the city but you know if if they have access to cdbg and home funds which are federal funds um they are able to offer programs that, that do exactly what you're talking about great thank you are there any other questions in the crowd Christine, there, there is one about um, a preferred list of modular companies. And I, um, I, I think from our perspective, it depends on what type of modular you're looking at. If you're looking at container or steel or wood. And I would also consider seriously the location of the company. Uh, the further away, the more challenging it can be just to go out to visit the factory for delivery times or if a road gets, you know, slowed down or, or, or there's construction on it. Um, so the closer the better, it, it, preferably within the region or one of the adjacent states. We've, we've heard of projects that we haven't worked on that were even outside of the country. And there's, there's just a lot of challenges with that, particularly with metric um, and, and non-metric. So um, again, if you're, you're welcome to call us and we can talk specifically about a, a particular project, but those are some things to consider when going modular. Great, thank you, Michael. Okay, there doesn't seem to be any other questions. Um, again, I'll reiterate that uh, the recording of this program will be available, we'll make it available on our chapter website, and it will also be available on YouTube under uh, the search AIA California, along with the, the previous three programs. Um, just a couple announcements before you go about our chapter. Um, we have our monthly social architecture. That is tomorrow, first Thursday of, of almost every month. And it's tomorrow at 6 p.m. at Phantom Carriage in Carson. And save the date, December 2nd, for our holiday party and annual meeting. And that is going to be on the Yacht Ibiza. So stay tuned for details on that. Okay, thank you, everyone, and have a great day.